guys, is uh, what do you do to continue improvement of your mentoring program? I'm going to let Jan and Laura um, I try to listen to the mentors and the clients alike. People are very passionate about whatever they're doing, but um, often what they're doing gets kind of confused when people come to you and say they want to be about the project or they're going to training. They agree to everything, just like the clients do. But a lot of times people have another agenda. I have an aunt who's um, about 84. And she's been very successful in about every area of life that I can, that she's touched. She told me that half the people that are going to come to you are really sincere and they're voluntary. There's another half that have other agendas. And you really got to listen to people and kind of um, work with them. And sometimes you need to be directed uh, a little more than you should because who are they here to serve, who are we serving, that gets very confused on many occasions. Now we have a mentor advocate on our board who tries to listen uh, to the mentors that they have issues that uh, I can't resolve. And um, my experience has been what the advocate had, that they really uh, been really useful in certain situations that we have with our board. We have a working board. Everybody on the board has a job. Everybody does certain things. And when situations come, we come back to the board and we try to address them and change. Last year, it was a difficult situation and we instituted a, um, a mentor um, understanding, agreement of understanding, which was very important that uh, had to be added later. Due to confusion that was happening, with uh, one of our volunteers. We also, uh, because of the, the board, um, we all worked together uh, a couple years ago. We changed our program because our program initially was for two years and uh, it was changed that the clients had to work towards one because we work collectively. Um, uh, the, it's, dang, I'm lost in the question again. <coughs> but uh, I think that our, we all, I think it's because of the board. The board works collectively to improve our program, and I think everybody listens to each other. And I also want to uh, recommend uh, or commend you for your training program, uh, which as a mentor, there's a mentor training program, and it's basically it takes about eight hours uh, done on two consecutive days. Uh, no, not consecutive, well, like consecutive weekends yes. or five weeks. Two twice we met for four hours. And uh, there's also a training manual, which is very thick. And I just thought it was very done very professionally uh, and in-depth about what is the nature of homelessness in America, what, what is the role of a mentor, what can we expect what do we expect of our clients? What can they do for themselves? And how we can encourage that? So we have that training program. Because with that organization, it's about the clients uh, learning how to live independently on their own. And uh, whatever tasks that they do, we have certain things that we require, but they have set their own tasks. And we expect them to complete their own tasks or do really just set their own goals. Yeah. Their goals do their tasks. I'm going to turn it over to Monique. Um, the first thing that I thought of in regards to um, just keeping that relationship with mentors is we definitely survey them a lot and we have open discussions because we want to we want to keep them there. We want to keep them there as long as they want to be there. So if something isn't going right or something isn't fitting, we want to have that open so uh, we'll have definitely do uh, beginning of the year surveys, mid year surveys, and end of the year surveys. And we go back, and for each of the each of the sites we have, we have VPCs, which we call volunteer program coordinators. And they're like our leaders. And so we compile the data from the survey, and we'll meet with them at the summer, at the end of the summer, and then at the beginning of the fall, and say these are the results. Yeah, we had one out of seventy five volunteers that said they don't feel that the training is adequate. Okay, so that's 
sending off a signal because yeah, we may have some other volunteers who are like, oh, it's wonderful, everything is heaven. And, but they may honestly feel like, well, that training isn't adequate. And so like this year, we had a specialist come in to talk about learning, learning to work with kids who have disabilities. And these are any type of disabilities. And you would not believe that at the end of the, the session, all of the volunteers had all of these questions. And so out of one person responding saying the training was adequate, I don't know how to work with kids who are having issues. And so because we took that one grief, you know, that one comment serious, we got a response from a lot of volunteers. So we, I, we take it seriously because they, our organization is ran 95% by volunteers. And so if we lose even half of them, you know, what are we going to do? Our kids lose that, you know, that mentoring and they lose that relationship that they have with the volunteers. So, I think that's the biggest thing. And also, because our volunteers have been there for a long time and the staff members have been there for a long time, again, it's, it honestly is like a family. And so, you know, sometimes families are dysfunctional. We have to pull things to the side and we'll have a conversation and we'll talk and we'll readjust. But uh, again, that open dialogue, constantly staying on top of surveying them, having those leaders in the area where you can say, look, what type of feedback are you getting from the volunteers? What do we need to change? What do we need to improve? Well, I see that uh, Thomas can come back this year. Did you find out what was going on? And taking those things and actually applying them and staying on top of them so we can retain that. And then letting them know that their input is valuable. You know, we don't just take things that you say lightly. If you say it's difficult, I don't, I don't want to work with a first grader, I'd rather work with a ninth grader, and I'm a specialist in math, then guess what? Next week, you're going to be with a ninth grader, and you're going to be the specialist in math because we have some kids who need you. And so, again, keeping that open communication, always making sure that you're, you know, you're including them in the process because they want to be included, and they and they want to feel like they're making the investment. And so, if you allow them to do that, man, you'll, you'll keep them, and you'll have people coming back year after year. And then you still have people who leave after all that love and love and kiss and investment that they made. They'll leave. You know, because but in the end, I think making sure that they are part of the process and taking them seriously and then also um, structure too. Oh my God. My first year at CYP, I was just like this free bird. I'm like, oh yes, we want you. And oh, we love, we love it. And yes, oh, we'll put you wherever here. We need you here. It didn't work. I lost a lot of volunteers. And I learned coming back the next year, okay, they need structure. They need organization. They need specifics. If you tell them they're going to be paired with one child for the entire year, they need to be paired with one child for the entire year. Now, there comes a time when that person may be paired with two kids, you need to let them know. You're sure volunteers? This sure year you might be paired with two years. Keeping them abreast and on top of everything because they appreciate that and they'll come back. I think the most important thing, one of the things I tell mentors and facilitators that come work with our program, you know, everybody's like, oh, these girls need to know this, and I need to teach them this, this, that, and the other. Um, I think the most important thing is you have to be transparent, and you have to be willing to grow through the process just as much as you have the expectation for the young people to grow, to learn, and mature. And I think that's a commitment we all have to make, and we try and make an organization. We're graduating our first class of fifth graders. We're graduating our first complete class of eighth graders who have been with us since sixth grade. They change and they grow every year. That means we can't be static and take the summers off. If we did this this year, we have to up the ante the next year. When you're realistic about today's society and the kids, I mean, everything's immediate. There's immediate gratification. They're used to excitement right here and now. Everything changes. So that means our program has to change too. It doesn't mean that the core principles, the core life skills that we teach them are the same life skills that we've been teaching for years, but in how we present it, how we think about what we'll be engaging to them and how to take it to the next notch is important to make sure that we keep our kids, because that's my primary target audience. But then I have to think about the mentors. They want to do something new and different too. Um, and providing them those opportunities to have that input to grow us. And the same thing with our partners, our business partners. Not only are we providing more dynamic or different programming for the kids that they're involved with, their mentors are invested, but how do we partner with them in ways that make sense to them 
and their bottom line. And that's something I learned from that national mentoring conference. How do I speak to businesses? Uh, what makes sense to them? Profit and dollars. And so, you know, how do I partner with them to say, you know what, we could be getting better press if we did X, Y, Z. You got us sitting here at this table, passing out these flyers, and these people are not paying attention to us. You're doing great things with us. You need to, you know, we need to come together to figure out better ways for us to get better attention for you and us um, to make it more of a fruitful partnership. So I think we're always thinking about how things get new and get better. And that's the commitment. You can't be idle. I've worked with a lot of programs to take the summer off, to take this time off. Well, we got a new program. And then you come back the next year, they, the kids are pissed off because it's like we did this in fifth grade. Why are we doing this again? So you have to be committed to constantly changing and constantly growing um, and being transparent. Um, we can make those mistakes when you did this and you don't know what to do. Reach out, talk to people. Uh, I had a mentor that used to tell me, I was like, I'm tired. And she said, if you get to be my age and you're tired, what are you going to do? And the key was, I wasn't reaching out and talking to people, talking to my colleagues, meeting people, and just being okay with not being perfect to figure out what is the next interesting, dynamic thing um, that people can bring to the organization. So being committed to growth uh, and, and, and how that comes to you, I think, is really critical in constantly making sure your program evolves. Okay. Um, so how do we help uh, the programs improve? Uh, I've, I've always treated what I was doing as a business uh, uh, and, and satisfied customers uh, uh, keep coming back to your store over and over again. Uh, at the mentoring summit last week, I, I heard uh, one person in one of the workshops say, kids vote with their feet. And, and I've always felt that that's really important. We're not a school-based program. We don't have a captive audience. Uh, kids uh, go home uh, and then they come back to us a couple hours later uh, uh, after work. So if we're not providing a good uh, 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 product to the kids and to the volunteers that's interesting, constantly refreshed, good structure, uh, uh, they will vote with their feet. So I've always tracked attendance. I, I, every week, I get volunteers, they check in. I, I, we, we, we put their names down. We, uh, after the session, we put it in an Excel spreadsheet, and, and we begin to look at the percentages. We look at the trends. Uh, I, I, and, and we look at, has someone been missing one, two, or, or how many times? And, and we begin to follow up on that. And, and from year to year, uh, uh, our, our goals are that uh, uh, at least 80% of the kids are about they're here every week, and then we keep most of them through the year, and most of them come back year after year after year. You know, when we talk about mentoring, uh, and, and Kelly talked about the buzzword, I, uh, there's a lot of people that think that mentoring is a magic pill that can solve any problem. And I don't believe that. Uh, I believe mentoring is something that can help kids grow up. And, and I think uh, that if you look around uh, at all the different mentoring programs, I, I don't see that at the first thing on their website uh, that it says, we get a kid here, and eight years later he's here, and 10 years later he's here, and, and we're trying to do this. A, a long-term vision, uh, uh, Chicago Youth Program's website is a really good website that I encourage you to go to because they show a lot of this stuff, with bar graphs and so forth. So, A, uh, we, we, we track participation, we, we look at our numbers, and we try to get better every year. We can't get better every year if we can't keep a core staff in our program. Now, in, in my organization, I've been the glue for 35 years. Uh, we have uh, a core of volunteers that have been involved anywhere from three up to 20 years. Uh, uh, and, and so they, they provide the, the culture of the organization, the experience base of the organization. But the, the people that are the day-to-day -day running the, the program, this is the weak link. Uh, because young people coming to us uh, uh, to work, they, there's no college preparing people to do this work. Uh, and, and the work hours and the pay and the condition of working in a nonprofit, uh, 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 bad things happen to kids. Uh, they don't all stay. It, it, it doesn't work for everyone. And so it's hard keeping people in place for more than a couple of years. By the time they begin to know what they're doing, they're leaving. And, 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 and yet, in a business, you couldn't run a business with that kind of instability. Uh, and yet, to, to make 
these programs effective, I, 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 we have to find a way to keep a core group of people there decades. And, 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 then, and, and then we have to create a learning organization. You know, uh, through the Tutor Mentor Connection, uh, we've got a database of close to 200 youth organizations in Chicago. We, we point to their websites. So uh, uh, any volunteer, any parent, anyone can look at the websites of other programs. And some of them do a really good job of showing what they do. They have their handbooks, they have their uh, training manuals. You can learn from them uh, uh, how you do what you would do in your program. Our, our website always has our calendar of uh, everything we're going to do week to week from September uh, to May. Other programs could run their program off of what we do to post our volunteers because we made it transparent. Not everyone does that. But enough people do that, that if, if you created a learning organization, both in the program, in the church, in the business, we all can be learning from the same information. And, and, and from that information, we may apply it differently because we're all different, our programs are different, our kids are different, uh, but we're constantly trying to improve on what we do based on what we were able to measure that we saw important the previous year. It, it's a constant effort to try to get better that, that is made possible by the information that's available and by the people uh, uh, that you can retain in an organization to be able to help you do this.